Hey, Steve Mignani doing the junkyard crawl here at Burnison Auto Wrecking in Burnison, Massachusetts. This is a 1966 Chrysler Imperial Crown four-door hardtop. Now, we all know, of course, that the Imperial line was Chrysler Corporation's answer to Cadillac and Lincoln. Well, check this out. They never sold nearly as many. In 1966, Cadillac sold 194,212 cars. Lincoln sold 54,755 Imperial in total. 13,742, like a fraction of Lincoln and a tiny fraction of Cadillac. So what was wrong? I don't know. Maybe it was an answer to a question nobody was asking, but of those 13,742 1966 Imperials, well, most were hardtop four doors like this. In fact, 10,855. So again, the convertibles and the two doors were very much in the minority. Most people bought the big four door just like this. Now here's the thing about 66. It was the final year for body on frame construction from Imperial and made these things killers on the demolition derby circuit. In fact, this is the business end right here for decades, the 70s, 80s, 90s, even in the early 2000s, these big Imperials, 66 and earlier, this is what you do. You put the car in reverse and take out your opposition with this massive trunk and bumper. Again, body on frame construction. For 67, Chrysler went to a unit construction platform which wasn't nearly as strong. And in fact, these things were so effective on the demo derby circuit that they were outlawed in many states. So if you had a 66 Imperial, you went from a winner to a loser. And that's good with me. I hate the idea of demoing these things. But if we look here at the tail of this thing, the styling is, uh, is a lot toned down from the Virgil Exner era. That's because a guy named Elwood Angle arrived from Ford in the early 60s to tone things down. Still a little weird. We can see here at the back sort of a hint of the Lincoln Continental spare tire hump, and that's because Elwood Engel designed the Lincoln Continental, the 6162, that landmark car, and brought with him a lot of those styling traits. But the details are beautiful. Here's the Imperial Crest here, and you drop it down, and there's the gas tank filler. You've got to wonder how many thousands of gallons of gasoline this car sucked down and burned out and turn in the gases through that single exhaust. But again, it's not the only one, of course. Uh, this car might have gotten 14 miles to the gallon, but inside this beautiful deck lid is a huge trunk compartment. Look at this. And again, this frame rails underneath this. This is not unit construction, so this is built like a tank. Uh, the trunk floor in this thing, the carpeting, let's look underneath it. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it has the usual, you know, the, the rust that starts to happen when the metal sweats. But here is the spare tire cover, and underneath it, there it is, the original uh, wheel. Now, this is a 15 by 6, but the deal with Imperial, unlike Chrysler, Dodge, Plymouth, Valiant, it has a big bolt pattern. In fact, that's a five on five and a quarter inch pattern, which is larger than, uh, say, like a Chrysler New Yorker or a Newport. These wheels fit only the Imperial. And they kind of look like the, uh, the Chrysler or the, the Mopar rally wheels of 1970. But these vents right here were seen as early as, I think it's 1958. And they helped to let hot air away from the brakes to cool the brakes off. And the brakes got a workout. These cars weighed about two and a half tons and then fully loaded far more than that. But again, this is the four door hard top body. You can roll the windows down, it's wide open. Next best thing to a convertible. And again, 10,855 of the 13,742 Imperials were four doors like this one. The smallest number were convertibles, very rare and desirable. But inside, we see uh, lots of neat things. Uh, in fact, the telescoping and tilt wheel, $92.45 right here. Not only does it uh, tilt, you know, to get uh, a fellow with a big gut like me inside the car, but it also telescopes. Look at that, kind of cool. It even has the loose uh, horn button option. That was very rare. But this right here, this was uh, $92.45. You turn that down. Uh, oh, well, okay. But anyway, there it is. That's kind of rare. Also has uh, headrests, $52.45. And again, headrests were not mandatory on US cars till 69, but here they are optional. And again, $52.45. Air conditioning, $452.25. The numerous outlets here, of course, tell us this car is air conditioning. And 92% of all Imperials got AC in 1966. Uh, it also has the uh, headlight dimmer, $45.00. 19 cents right there and the sensitivity of this thing can be dialed up or down and what this does it has basically uh, a photo cell inside that dims your headlights automatically to oncoming traffic the radio is kind of cool this is the uh, the uh, 
AM, but it has local and distance settings on the slider. And what that does, there are transistors and resistors inside that increase the sensitivity so the radio station stays dialed in without you having to mess with it. And again, total options on this thing were $714. So uh, on top of a $4,900 car. So a pretty well loaded example. Now under the hood, we'll find something special. And again, here's those cool 15 by 6 inch wheels with the factory slots and that massive five uh, and a quarter inch bolt pattern, Imperial only. No disc brakes in 66, this would have been big 12 inch drums, but under the pancake hood, and again, we, we talked about Elwood Angle, uh, again, the, the stylus from Lincoln, and you can see the pancake hood, no more drop down, no wrap around. This is very much like the 61, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, Lincoln Continental with this pancake hood. So Elwood Engel made sure it appeared on the Imperial. So here it is, you open the hood. And for the first time in 1966, the 440 replaces the 413. Power went from 340 to 350. And uh, this is the same essential engine that also became the Roadrunner uh, 446 pack, the Charger RT's 440, same bones. Good, good cylinders, I mean, good good engine right there. Now we talked about Elwood Engel. This is a collectible automobile magazine from June 2000, 22 years ago. I bought this magazine, I still have it. But anyway, inside of this is the story of how Elwood Engel, the fellow with the circle, came from Lincoln Mercury to Chrysler and kind of displaced Virgil Exner. And on the left-hand side, we see uh, these are styling proposals. The top one, that's an Exner design. He got a little crazy. Look at that thing with these whacked out windows. But as you work your way down, you get into the era of Engel, Elwood Engel. And at the bottom, we see much more conservative designs. And uh, so that was basically Elwood Engel. Now, shareholders, uh, Chrysler sales were not strong. Virgil Exner's strongest years were like 1956, 7, 8. 59, 60, 61, things got weird. 62, really weird. So, you know, Elwood came in to, to turn things around. Of course, Virgil Exner had lung cancer and he wasn't really at the height of his powers in the later years. So anyway, but he did his best. But something kind of cool, 65 and 6, unique. The Perspex are these, these glass Pyrex headlight covers right there. That's standard stuff. Very, very cool touch. And I remember the, the Green Hornet uh, spy car from the TV show had, it was based on one of these type of Imperials. But that's a cool touch. Again, only 65 and 66. And uh, factory air conditioning, again, on 92% of these things. And one thing that's a little confusing to some Mopar people is the VIN on this has a J in the fifth spot for the 440. Well, in 67 through 69, J means means 426 Hemi, but only in B bodies, like Roadrunners, Chargers, that kind of stuff. So don't be confused. J was used for the 440 and 66, but uh, would become Hemi. And of course, there's the Chrysler Corporation Autopilot. That's the uh, cruise control. And again, the air conditioning. One thing that's kind of weird about Chrysler AC is it's basically a V-twin, like a mini Harley-Davidson engine. By contrast, GM's Frigidaire was more of a cylinder. It was a rotary vein type pump. So these are a little louder and not as efficient. This is one area where GM air conditioning was actually better than Chrysler's, but Chrysler had this V-twin AC unit for years and years. And here's one right here. But again, this is a body on frame car. It has torsion bars, but it's it's like a tank, body on frame. And again, these things, I hate to say it, were, were spent and used up at demo derbies all throughout the United States until the late 90s, I believe, when uh, these things were kind of outlawed. I mean, they had classes just for Imperials, but if you had this thing out there against a bunch of uh, Cadillacs or, or other American cars, you just put this thing in reverse, look over the seat, and just use the tail as a battering ram. Uh, you'd be the last one standing, and you'd win the trophy at the Demo Derby. Not that this car wants to go to the Demo Derby. It's a little rusty, but it's so complete that it deserves to be restored and, and preserved and saved. Um, and one last thing here is kind of cool, the Certa card, which is sort of like a little credit card that when you bought your Chrysler Corporation card, put your name and number on it, you bring it in, get your, your service done. Here's the holder for it right here. It's like a little credit card holder. There it is right there. Vehicle Certa card would fit right into this little spot here. It's no longer present, but I always look on Mopar to see if the Certa card is still around and the holder's there. But uh, anyway, so that's the story of how Elwood Engel uh, tried to help Imperial take down Cadillac and Lincoln. It never did happen. But with that said, these are still very popular cars and they have their own place in the collector world. And well, this one here at Burns and Auto Rec ain't going anywhere soon and there's a no crush policy here so it's it's safe here it won't, and it won't be going to the demo derby that's for sure but if you like this video be sure to subscribe to the steam mags youtube channel ring the bell click the button all that good stuff and certainly stick around there's plenty more with this kind of